Hello and welcome to the Media Podcast. I'm Matt Deegan. Think of us as your special media club. Uh, on today's show, are the YouTubers about to steal your supper? Why some TV execs are troubled by the rise of copycat formats online? Uh, also on the program, podcast growth continues. But which formats could make it onto TV? And what genres are missing for growing a mainstream audience? Uh, plus, Rob Burnett returns to the Telegraph. Why the Racing Post is angry with Radio 4. And in the media quiz, we play which person is this about? Uh, that's all to come on this edition of the Media Podcast. In the news this week, Julian Assange has returned to Australia for the first time in over 14 years after pleading guilty to conspiring to obtain and disclose classified defence documents, uh, which were subsequently reported on by The Guardian and other publications. Uh, the WikiLeaks founder agreed to the US charge, having effectively served his term uh, in the UK in Belmarsh Prison. Uh, the UK's free-to-air broadcasters came together for the official launch of Freely, uh, with the BBC's Tim Davey, ITV's Carolyn McCall and Channel 4's Alex Mann all made making impassioned speeches for free access to high quality television. Uh, Davey told the audience, if you want to keep a society together, it's having free access to these services where prominence is not about the person who can pay the biggest check. Uh, And Labour has committed to retaining tax-free relief for the creative sector uh, if they win power next week. Uh, Chris Bryant, who's currently Shadow Minister for Creative Industries and Digital, also expressed concern at the plight of freelancers this year, saying, I would like to see at the end of the five or maybe ten years of Labour, if we were to come into government, that you would have fewer people relying on such an insecure work pattern. Uh, Well, with me in the London Podcast Studios for the next decade and beyond, uh, we welcome back Broadcast Magazine's Insight Editor, Rebecca Cooney. Hello. Hello. (laughs) For the next decade and beyond, am I trapped in here now? You are, I'm afraid you are trapped. Um, uh, What have you been writing about recently? uh, So most of my uh, focus has been taken by Hot Shots, which Ah. is our uh, emerging talent scheme, um, which is kind of a huge piece of work, but is like just a brilliant thing to do. There is so much talent in the TV industry. And Excited, jealous, thinking, why didn't I do more? Oh, yeah, you do have a crisis. I mean, there was one of them that has the exact same birthday as me. And I was like, <laughs> oh, OK, rub it in what you've done with your life. Um, but no, it is like it is just it's quite inspiring um, in between the kind of bouts of like jealousy and ex- existential crisis. Uh, it's, and does anybody make up the history? Any know, written yeah. by ChatGPT? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I couldn't. That hadn't occurred to me, actually. Oh, God. <laughs> Run them through the checkers. Yes. When's it out? Uh, so it's out today. Um, yep, in the magazine and online. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a massive piece of work, but it's, it's brilliant. So I guess so. have a look now at broadcastnow.co.uk. Yes. Uh, and next to Rebecca making her media podcast debut, it's entertainment producer Rena Dialgi. Hello. Hi. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. No, I'm excited to be here. And I just just before we started, I said, I have to apologise for anything I say. I've got no filter. Excellent. That's exactly what we want. Um, you've worked on lots of big entertainment shows over the years. Friday Night Project, Graham Lawson Show, The Big Breakfast Revival. Uh, do the leaders' debates cut the mustard from an entertainment producer's standpoint? Do you know what? I was watching it last night and... Um, I was thinking, what is that noise? And I, at first, because I was sat in the garden, I thought, is it always oh, there a cat at the bottom of the garden? And then I thought, no, that is noise just bleeding out. And there must have been a protest mm, or something. Mm, yes. But that I just was so distracted by that. It was unbelievable. And then I just thought, you could done done a bit more with it. And More format points? Yeah. And I just kept like... I would get like Martin Lewis to absolutely like <laughs> grill them and host them. And actually, you would probably get like an uprising mm. and a coup would happen on the night. I'd be up for that. Martin Lewis, that'd be a fun addition. And Rebecca, have yeah. you been watching the election debates? Yes, yep. I've watched bits of them. Uh, I know, so you're distracted by the noise going on in the background, but not whether or not Rishi Sunak said a rude word. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I felt he was so on the defensive yesterday yeah. and he just looked like really hysterical and he was just like uh, uh, and he just kept jumping in and then yeah. Keir Starmer was doing that so Keir Starmer was doing that really pass- passive aggressive thing of going if you just let me finish <laughs> and stop being hysterical uh, and on the broadcasters do you think anybody's done anything different or is having a good election so not on broadcast mm. linear tv no I um 
I'm, I'm trying to convince myself I'm young. So <laughs> I watch most of the stuff on online. Yep. Mm. And um, just scrolling through Instagram and stuff. And the person that has caught my attention is Munya Chihuahua, who's obviously mm. really yep. great, a satirical comedian. And I find that his little videos just really grab me. They're really funny. And they put put stuff in layman's terms, but also just, just really mm. funny. And he's got a Radio 4 um, series. And... Um, when I was listening to it, I just thought, if Channel 4 had any money, this would have absolutely mm, mm. been a smash hit on Channel 4. And you can, when you're listening to it, it's really funny. And you can almost see it. You can see the sketches and he does all these funny voices. And you think this would be a brilliant bit of election coverage. And like fresh as well. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, it's on Radio 4 now. It's probably not reached uh, the audience it, it needs. Well, the picture's always better on the radio, obviously. (laughs) Uh, I thought I saw Labour today um, put out a clip on their Twitter that's basically an LBC clip that they've sort of animated, uh, which is someone making quite a good comparison of like, if if someone had come around your house and was trying to fix your bathroom and they were still there four months later uh, saying, (laughs) oh, it's not my fault, or something was late, my leg hurts, all these things, you'd go and get someone else to do your bathroom. But I thought, interesting, they took an LBC clip of a, Mm. of a, a normal listener talking about that and using that for their for their marketing. Probably uh, 14 years later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's jump into some of the media stories of the week. Uh, the company behind Big Brother Survivor and Total Wipeout has lashed out at YouTube copycats. Uh, Rebecca, this is Banner Jay and their chief content officer of operations, Lucas Green. Uh, what's he been saying? Well, essentially the point was uh, there are people on YouTube just and making to quite a professional standard, right? We're not talking about somebody in their bedroom just talking into their laptop um, or into their phone. They are making kind of knockoffs of TV shows mm. uh, that we would recognise. And, and you know, Luke Screen was saying, actually, some of these are, you know, even using the bra- same branding. So it's not even just we've stolen the format or we're using something that's a bit like it. It's kind of very, very similar, which I just thought was such an interesting phenomenon. But kind of, I think, as he says, he's, it, the idea is, with these comments is, I want to start the debate. I want to have the conversation yeah. because it is that kind of weird thing of where sort of, you know, stuff people are doing at home is professionalizing is becoming more indistinguishable more people are moving to youtube to get a lot of their content so you know where it wouldn't have been a threat 10 15 Mm. years ago it just would have been like oh what are these guys doing it now is more of an issue and probably we do need to have a conversation about okay what's acceptable what's not what's possible most people aren't really that kind of au fait with copyright law and things like Mm. that Um, i mean rena lucas was saying that uh yeah, these people sort of know what they're doing, and but they're not sort of gettable from a legal perspective. And do they look bad if they attack these people? I and mean, he's right, isn't he? He is. He is right. And do you know what? I kind of think it. It feels a bit like you know, like the old TV dinosaur were saying, "Well, that's not yeah. fair. Look yeah. at them." Because the thing is, the the show that I think that they were talking about yeah. was Sidemen Inside, and that was. But it was a rip off of Big Brother. Right. So actually, Sidemen um, and The Chase, ITV Studios has been really smart because obviously they're, so they're coming from a slightly different point. They've worked with Sidemen to do Sidemen Does the Chase. So yeah. they've kind of gone, OK. Co-opted it. Yeah, come yeah. in. And actually, this is part of our branding now. Mm. We've got you rather than you getting our IP. So, yeah, there is something there about... There's that push yeah. and pull. And they, mm. I think it's... A, it's And it's, it's really reflective of the industry at the minute is that it's this new wave. And actually, what do we do? Do we try and fight them or do we embrace it? So um, Side Men Inside, for example wasn't that wasn't publicized didn't have this big trails or anything mm. probably did online but again i'm not the market but i know that my brother sister-in-law and all of them would have watched it um i watched it it was very basic mm. um had very copycat elements they had the the uh, sticking heads in a boxes from i'm a celeb right yes. they had the shopping list from big brother they had um or oh, from a different show, you know, mm. where you basically, if you choose to have a shower, you lose 500 quid. Right, yeah. You could buy a bed for 25 grand and it comes out the prize pot. But their figures were insane. Mm. And they got viewing figures. I think their final was like 6.6 million. Well, obviously, a lot of inspiration for these sorts of things come from Mr. Beast. He's sort yes. of the ultimate person at doing all of these things. I mean, oddly, he's crossed, crossed sides because he has a new Amazon show coming out called Beast Games. Have you seen this? Yeah. I've seen the the announcement. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, he he has hundreds of interviews uh, on YouTube, but 
would still like to to take Amazon's money or maybe resources to do yeah, something. Yeah, but I bet they've given him a lot of money. <laughs> and they've probably yeah. given him a lot of leeway as well. Because yeah. like his one of his videos the other day was a rip-off of Total Wipeout. Yeah. He did a massive obstacle course that was knocking someone off a, a mm. swing and stuff. Mm. But it got like 150 million views. Mm. So I think, you know, he is someone that is very clever, really knows the market. And it is one of those that if we don't start getting in with these people, and to be honest, it's probably too late. Mm. Because like you said, 10, 15 years ago, we ignored them. Mm. When actually that's when we should have been going, oh, do you know what? Why don't we work with you your way Mm. and not trying to conform them into the old TV style. Well, exactly, because there are some people who would be very happy to have Amazon's money and, yes, yes, be on TV. But there are people who go, actually, do you know what? I quite like doing my own thing, being Mm. charged my own. I make money through advertising deals anyway. Why do I need you? Um, Which kind of traditional TV doesn't always have an answer for. Does it make you as a producer think differently about how you make things? Now, some of Mr Beast productions are very expensively done, um, but they probably come at it from a slightly different direction. Uh, are we stuck with sort of following how things have always been done when we make shows? Yes. And I, I feel really strongly about this mm. in that, you know, I worked on a show um, a f- uh, probably like five years ago and it was a big old beast. Um, one of these shows that you'll all know, singing competition talent mm. show. And I thought, do you know what? I'll just do it to see what it's like. But it was so regimented mm. to the point where even changing the colour of the graphics from blue for boys and pink for girls. Mm. I argued for about <laughs> a week and said, please, <laughs> Can we just do like green and orange yeah. or something different? Because blue and pink don't really go anymore. Yes. Mm. And, you know, there's a whole, all of Gen Z who are, you know, whatever they want to be and good for them, yeah. great. Um, and it doesn't apply. And I think you alienate people. And I do think that TV basically caters for, at the minute, and this terrifies me, um, young kids, well, not even young kids, that family viewing slot. Yep. That's it. And then basically from, I would say, 40 up, mm. maybe 45. Are there channels or networks or indies that are uh, taking that on? Or are people just leaning into it because that's where the money is and people know that your audience will, 50 plus audience will turn up. Let's let's program for them. I don't think people, I don't think the big studios and stuff know what to do which is why there's this big reshuffle panic redundancies merging everything so like itv studios are now thinking right we need to go into digital but what are they actually doing Mm. Mm -hmm. um so yeah so i just think it's a new wave that and maybe we need a whole load of young fresh people to tell us actually do you know what you've been doing it this way for 50 years, switch it up now, and then we'll be doing it a different way for the next 50. I mean, Rebecca, Broadcast covers uh, the acquisitions. Um, TV loves getting a show from a different market and importing it, or for the UK, exporting it. Um, mm. Should they be importing the YouTubers' ideas uh, rather than worrying about them copying the old ones? I think so, yeah. But like I say, it, it depends if the YouTubers want to come and, yeah. and be imported and probably, you know, like... like um, you were saying earlier, it's probably quite difficult for the big media company to sue the little podcast, the mm. little uh, um, YouTuber. But actually, if the YouTuber says, hey, Banerjee stole my idea, <laughs> that's not going to play well for Banerjee um, at all. So, yeah, I think it is if, if they can co-op them. And where they, and like I said, there are a lot of partnerships. We've got our digital awards coming up next uh, next week where there are a lot of partnerships that are working. TV is starting to do this, but it is slower and it's probably not hitting the kind of audience markers that... that sort of TV is used to and isn't seeing anymore, whereas yeah, these YouTubers are hitting these massive audiences. Uh, well, those podcast research is out from Edison. Uh, the headlines include 30% of the population hearing a podcast in the last week. This is UK data, uh, which is up 5% uh, on the year. Um, uh, Edison also behind the top 25 podcasts. Um, uh, Rebecca, those shows uh, are pretty popular too. Um, they reach a large number of podcast listeners, don't they? They do indeed, yes. Um, and I was quite reassured by this that sort of it was breaking down saying actually young people are listening to them quite a lot because mm. I was kind of, I wasn't sure if that was, you know, if I was kind of edging myself into a certain audience because I, I love a good podcast. Um, but I think it's really interesting that kind of, yeah, no, younger people are, are very into um, podcasting as well and listening to podcasts. And, the, and those top 25 um, collectively they get to half of 
UK podcast listeners. Mm. So if, you, if you're trying to advertise, if you wanted to reach podcast listeners, you need to be on all, all 25 of those. Uh, but there's quite a long tail uh, with thousands of smaller podcasts um, reaching the last 25%. So you can get, I think you can get to, to 50% with the top 25. But even if you add in the top 300, I think you only reach the, the top the 75% of UK listeners, uh, which means there's like a huge long tail if, if you want, want to reach people. I mean, is this a problem for advertisers who want to use podcasts podcast because a lot of advertisers do want to hit that mass that mass audience yeah i think so and i think it is something i mean very similar to the tv industry is seeing you know advertisers want to get more bang for their buck at the moment because you know when money is tight they cut their advertising budget so if they're going to spend it they want it to go further um and it does mean that that gets more difficult for podcasters to try and sort of you know make a bit of money there is less there's just less room, less money around for people. Um, I think it does create a lot of difficulty. Uh, well, Reen, looking at those uh, top 25 podcasts and the genres you can see. So uh, as, a, as a producer, anything missing from there that you, you think podcasting should jump on or, or vice versa, anything that um, telly should nick from successful podcasts? I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of broad things. There's, you know, Diary of a CEO, which I think is actually brilliant and should mm. be turned into... Well, you can get it on iPlayer TV as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. I missed mm. that. But um, but I think it's fantastic, that one, because it really covers a broad range of subjects. And mm. so not just, you know, business people, but just everything. And I can see why it appeals mm. to... Was it uh, was it women that it appealed yes. to most? Mm. Um, because, you know, you've got someone talking about this, the struggle of parenthood, but then also how to... Um, lose your mum pouch mm. and stuff like that. Mm. So it's really broad. And I think they market it really well as well. And there um, isn't a lot of long form interviewing of that type on telly. No, not anymore. Yeah, yeah. You've got your standard kind of, um, you know, chat shows and stuff, mm. which uh, I've done a lot of. And, and it does feel like once you've seen it, mm. oh, they're talking about their film. They've got one funny story, but that's it. <laughs> but actually things like, you know, this is your life back in the day yep. where they really dig deep that is that is a thing that i actually think would be great on screen again now is where you take someone like diary of a ceo mm. and you really really go for it um so i think that could be turned on on uh, screen um haven't listened to the, that peter crouch podcast yep. but no doubt anything that peter crouch does is very funny and will probably be turned into into something as well i think I think there's like, you know, there's Off Menu with M. Gamble and uh, James A. Caster, which has been going on for quite a while. And I know they've done tours and stuff, but mm. um, I'm surprised nothing has been done there. Chunks in Philly, you know, they've had loads of their own shows and stuff, so they're, they're not going to do anything. Um, but I just don't know. I wonder whether there's like some kind of, you know, it seems like everything is about strategy and gameplay and stuff mm. at the minute. So I wonder if there's like some kind of thriller, murder mystery type thing that's missing from there i mean rebecca a lot of podcasts do follow sort of a well-worn format uh, sort of a, the, the joke of the kind of the rest is politics things you get someone from one side one the other uh, and, and just kind of replicate it for every topic um do you think podcasts should be a bit more adventurous with some of their themes i mean i think there are the adventurous ones out there right mm. it's just these are the top ones yeah, that are sure. successful and of course yeah. that does encourage the big companies to kind of keep doing well let's just do a, another the rest is yeah. uh, and actually that's paying off because like the rest is entertainment uh, which I, I wouldn't listen to for a bit because I was like well it's a stupid name that's not a phrase <laughs> it's not a phrase is it um, uh, actually it's a very, just it's like a very good the, podcast I just like so. to look as the, the rest of entertainment is like it's just a more mainstream media podcast oh yeah but, no, that's very, that's much so, yeah. very much so very much so but yes no and it is it is, it is really good um, but um yeah, I think though that variety is out there, but it's perhaps not getting the mass audience in the same way. Um, it's interesting, there's not a lot of kind of fictional stuff in here. Mm. But yeah, I know that they do have, like I know a lot of fictional podcasts that do have kind of a bit of a cult following, but yeah, it's certainly not getting that kind of really broad Someone attention. was telling me about one the other day that actually did sound good, which was... I knew something was wrong. Oh, that's a good, that's a good and then you, yeah. And then it was like, but what was wrong? <laughs> Who was it? This is what I mean about I need to know. And I and it's those kind of bingey ones. Because sometimes, and I'm probably at fault of this, sometimes I find with podcasts that they can be a bit rambly. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. And, and it just feels to me as a producer that I, when I listen to them, I'm like, well, I'd tighten that bit up, and I would drop that. And but does, does that really make, does that make it lose its magic if you do yeah. if you do that? I suppose the magic is that because you don't have cameras pointing at you mm. um, all the time, and you don't have a big audience there, you do 
relax and you do you are a lot more unfilled which is great but just tighten it up a little bit please that's all i'm uh, saying no need to tighten you in the edit at all um you can uh, do you do you think I, mean, I see a lot of tv people maybe because of the state of, of the tv industry who are tr- thinking a lot more about podcasts and should they get into that space do you think tv skills um are valid for for podcasts oh 100 percent. like i i look at diary of a ceo mm. for example please give me a job <laughs> and um and like i've done entertainment but i know how to craft a story mm. i know what makes a good tr- contributor how to form an interview all of this editing how it's you know pacing all of that so i do think there's a whole raft of tv people out of work at the minute and i do think that that is something that um they could do yeah. yeah which i think is reflected in the top 25 actually if you look at it that you've kind of got no such thing as a fish which mm-hmm. is a qi spin-off um you've got uncanny which did have a tv or that, that went the other way um but you know they're kind of and um the news agents as well is sort of a tv folk really yes yeah, yeah. that's why mm-hmm. that's successful right because mm-hmm. they've got that following sort of from from before so i think there is there is definitely a little bit of cross-pollination going on isn't there yeah uh, well staying with entertainment and four former netflix execs have come together to launch an entertainment company called juno studios uh, so this is beck mortimer uh, fiona lamptey uh, amber taylor uh, and Vinny shergill uh, what's their pedigree rebecca um that they all do have this kind of yeah this netflix um uh, background so you know, they've been commissioning big things but they're not all on the creative mm. side i think which is quite interesting um so um fiona lamptey kind of has that sort of development producer uh, background um so she's kind of creative but actually you've got other skills in there around kind of marketing um around and it feels like it's kind of trying to be quite holistic and sort of be the full package effectively because obviously often with indies what you get is you know a bunch of creatives going yeah let's run a business let's mm. let's uh, you know try and make it work and, and they've got the creative stuff nailed down but actually don't necessarily know about the marketing and the other things so I think it's really interesting that you've got this group of people coming together who kind of have this sort of business overview of how it's going to work so I think it could be really interesting it does seem quite full service uh, Rena they say Juno Studios is forging a new path in entertainment our collective ex- expertise in storytelling runs across development production marketing marketing and distribution and we're excited to bring our entertainment experience to our partners uh, bullshit boilerplate or I mean um, it's very vague isn't it it's you know <laughs> I mean they're uh, going for the whole week we cover yeah. everything yeah and Rebecca also you know they've got a, you, new stories with fresh new voices <laughs> great I bet their first commission is a talent that's been on TV for 20 years <laughs> hopefully not but when I saw this story mm. I did think I literally gave them a round of applause just sat in my garden while I was reading <laughs> it because it was four women yep. yeah. four women running a company hallelujah like I um um, as an exec producer at the minute, I feel like I'm literally banging the drum saying, where are all the women? Where are you all? Because you are just in a room of men all the time. All the time. And they need to be in, in positions of power. Yeah, all yeah. the time. And, um, you know, whilst it is changing, it's slow. It's slow. So seeing that was brilliant a real step forward i just hope that they that the the picture of the four is the four and yep. that there's not right. a whole lot of men on the side <laughs> of it. right you could see the marketing expertise in those pictures because mm. they were just like proper black and white very fierce looking Beautiful. images yeah that they was were, like it was a, a great movie image. poster yeah they look like they are going to drop the hottest album <laughs> of the year like it was really something i was all for it i was yeah. like please this, <laughs> you look great and if you really deliver that would be amazing yeah. And I do have some sympathy with the kind of the 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 patter of like when you say because yeah. a friend of mine recently got a job at Indy and she sent me kind of oh this is the quote I'm doing for the press release what do you think about it and she and it was like you know I'm really delighted to be joining the company at such an exciting time and I was like <laughs> well it's what everybody says but also what else do you say yes. you know <laughs> like of course you say that I've gone for the money yes, yeah. yeah this seems stable they're not doing anything interesting but you know it's, yeah. it's a dodgy world out there what so. I want to know is why they all left Netflix yeah. <laughs> that's what I I uh, well, uh, Rebecca, is this a good time to launch a company like this? It's brave. Um, I, this is something that I've kind of, I've, one of my colleagues, Ellie uh, Khan, is currently working on a piece for us about this, like, who would launch an indie at the moment? Because mm. we have seen a few indies launching. Um, and it is a difficult time. There has been this massive commissioning slowdown. You know, indies are 
quietly or not so quietly going under it is a really difficult market but there are indies setting up and i think most of them are indies that have a big name they have or they have like one of the big super indies behind them there's a lot of money behind them or like these guys have this kind of netflix pedigree that they can go look we've been in netflix there's that's what i wonder whether they've already got a slate of ideas mm. that with with their whole netflix background Mm. they can just go here you go and Netflix will go, yeah, great. Yeah. Do you think relationships are the key to launching a production company? Yes. Or the ideas? 100%. Because you know the business, don't you? So, like, I know a few people who have worked within the networks and stuff, and now they've set up their own mm. indie. And they've just got a well-rounded picture of what the business actually is looking for. Because you could sit with commissioners and they tell you what they want, but actually... It's all rubbish, isn't it? So, and um, well, they're not sure where they want it from yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, I think relationships is key. Uh, okay, we're going to take a break uh, whilst we take some fierce photos, obviously, for our own <laughs> relaunch. I've but, got mine already. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll be right back after this. Uh, Welcome back. Rena and Rebecca are here for some more media news. And just a couple of weeks since uh, he announced he was off to the Washington Post, uh, Rob Winnett is to stay as the deputy editor of The Telegraph. Uh, This was a bit of a U-turn for uh, for poor Rob, wasn't it? A bit of a reverse ferret, uh, as as I believe it's called. Uh, Yeah, I I always find these stories very funny because it does feel like sometimes media businesses forget they employ journalists who will just (laughs) go away and look in stuff. I mean, I've been at companies where, you know, their annual accounts came out and everyone was going, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's how much they got paid, was it? Um, So yeah, it's it's a really interesting story. And I think it it does highlight the... um, the difference, I think, in culture in journalism mm. between the UK and America. And it may not actually be the most flattering or comfortable picture for UK journalism. So essentially the issue was the Telegraph paying for the disc that had the the files on for the expenses scandal. Yes. Which part of me goes, I actually don't see that much of a problem with that. But in America, that's such a no-no. Also, they say, for- they say the money was actually to cover the legal fees of the person that gave them the disc. Yeah, which I think is fair enough. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. Uh, it is interesting. We've touched it on, on the show before. I mean, Will Lewis told the truth to his staff. They did not like it and did not like hearing it from a Brit. Um, they have managed to, in effect, torpedo Rob's uh, position. Mm. And uh, Sir Will is not looking uh, that good where he is. Yes. And I mean, you do hear stories from, you know, I've got friends in sort of, you know, national newsrooms mm. and some of the things that conversations that have gone on, some of the things that said, I mean, just wouldn't pass, pass muster in HR in another British <laughs> industry. Like, it's just not okay to talk to your colleagues yes. like that. But it's, you know, everyone's on deadline. And we are all, I think, a bit in love with this idea of, no, but we can hack it and it's difficult yeah. and we do get stressed. And then we go down the pub and we tell each other we're brilliant afterwards. But, and there is something about that's probably not a very healthy way to run an industry, mm. actually. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I think there probably is a practicality to the British industry sometimes that perhaps the American industry lacks. I also think what's quite interesting, Rena, is that um, obviously um, uh, Rob Winnett has not come out of this looking great, but his position in the in the industry has been accelerated. If they, they thought that he'd be a great uh, addition uh, to that paper, um, do you think he's got some better chances here in the UK now? Oh, look, he'll probably get his own <laughs> channel. He'll probably, you know, like, look at Piers Morgan. <laughs> I, it did nothing did him wrong and he's fine and he's yeah. you know he's he's online but he's still going um so yeah it's it's probably elevated him to be fair it's probably brought his name to more people's mm. attention and they'll they'll be a big old fight for him now uh, mm. is all publicity good publicity yeah probably <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah. i think in, in now if yeah. you can get anyone talking about you mm. then yeah that is good uh, well, finally, just before the quiz, uh, the Today programme announced quietly on Monday that they were ending their daily racing tips, uh, which have been a staple since its inception. Uh, Arena, modernising Today programme's running order has seen off many an editor. The audience do not like change. Um, has this one been received? I mean, well, the Racing Post <laughs> are very saddened by it. So basically, I think... So I didn't know this was a thing, but... Yep. So they have three daily 
um, racing tips. Yeah, so like six, three, three sport, seven thirty, yeah, three, and eight thirty. Three sports bulletins, and there's racing tips after. Yeah. yeah, and so that to me already, it's just like wow, that is who needs that? Yeah, mm. and um, so I was quite surprised by that. But then you know they've done it for forty-seven years mm. or something like that. I thought uh, the way that Amal Ranjan did it was mm. actually broke the news was quite good, and that they didn't make a big song and dance about it before the first one mm. they waited till the end and went oh do you know what we missed it out but because it's gone the end and then, then just moved on very quickly but I you know good I mean the stay program good. I mean I have lots of issues with the stay program <laughs> uh, but they shouldn't have been doing gambling tips no it is a bit of an anachronism isn't yeah. it and I kind of could see because the racing post kind of thing was well this is classist and this is lots mm. of people like a flutter and, and today promo is out of touch it's like nah, it, it does feel like when gambling is more of a hot button issue now probably probably not also I don't think they were that good. And I say, I'm not an expert in racing form or anything like that. But I do remember there being a lot of stories where they would sort of go, Let's oh, yes. add up all of the suggestions. Yeah, we're all going, do you know one of ours won yesterday? <laughs> That's a surprise. It's like, that shouldn't be news, guys, if these are good tips. Like, that should be consistent. Or or I think there was mem- a memorable one where, like, the horse just refused to leave the starting yeah. box. Um, so, like, I don't think they were that useful. It just felt like a little bit of a ritual, like like that bit in a church service that nobody really understands and you just well, do it anyway. Well, speaking of which, should Thought for the Day be next for the axe? They, because they had a big song and dance a few years ago about making that secular, didn't they? Yes. And I sort of think I, I quite like Thought for the Day. Although, um, basically, whenever I'm having a hard time, my mum rings me up with her <laughs> Thought for the Day on on my situation, uh, which is very sweet. But also, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I think it'd be interesting to make it secular. I think the religious element, like I think it's really interesting and sometimes they will go to really mm. interesting places and they obviously had a bit of review of it because I remember a few years ago it used to be like that they would sort of start talking about a thing in the news and then go and I thought do you know that's a bit like Jesus yes. and they've obviously had a yeah. word in the briefing documents where they've gone please don't do that so I think that you do get some interesting things out of it but I think like open it up make it secular uh, well my local vicar father Rob often uh, does thoughts there and his of course are excellent <laughs> um, is there a place for it in a big breakfast program or is it is it a breakfast program is it a news program oh, i if you haven't already got this about me is <laughs> i do think that things need to be mixed up a little yeah. bit so whilst st- this has been running for 47 years and stuff including thought of the day and mm. you know i'll probably get shot down <laughs> i just think we have to start mixing these things up so make it secular change it if you want mm. but change switch it up again then in a year's time and then that way it'll keep running mm. but if you keep it the same you know, who's going to listen to it? That pool of people that mm. do listen to it, pair, older parents and stuff, mm. it will shrink. Yeah. And the show will eventually just go. And this is why podcasts are on the rise, yeah. because people are not listening to, you know, radio as much and all of this stuff. But I do, going back to the racing tips, I just think, you know, my dad loved <laughs> horse racing. He did. He really did. Um, but I just, it is the gambling element. Like, yes. how did that, how did they get away with it for that long? Well, it never used to be a problem. Yeah. And then it suddenly just gradually became a problem. Yeah. But then, and, you know, and then you've got the animal rights, all of that mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. You've got all of this noise around it. So, you know, they are bringing it back to only doing it for big occasions, which, you know, the whole country does yes. get behind. Yeah regardless of what your thoughts on the animal yeah. rights stuff and um, is. But I think it is a good move. And so switching up the thought of the day as well, I think would be a good one. Yeah, and I- there is a danger that the that the day programme does just get listened to by journalists, right? Because mm. they do get the politicians on and then journalists listen to it and then they have the story for the lunchtime bulletin, which is, you know, ex-politicians said this on the set. And there is a bit of a danger that it becomes a bit yeah inward looking into the industry I, I always think like it was the sort of only place if you wanted that for quite a long time mm. where in effect you can kind of do what you like because they're not going to go anywhere else uh, whereas now times radio or five live or other podcasts you can't just keep the format because it's always been there you've actually got to innovate to keep listeners and they probably haven't had to really face that before mm. um so perhaps that's a good thing too uh right speaking of formats time for the media quiz uh, this week we're playing the very innovative format which person is this about um after exhausting all of our creative efforts on last week's offcom or romcom uh, we're back to more traditional fare where i will tell you a story from the week 
and you've just got to tell me the person at the center of it. So buzz in with your names if you know the answer. So Rebecca, you will say... Rebecca. And Rena, you will say... Rena. Let's play which person is this all about? Question number one. Who will be stretching the definition of breakfast to breaking point? Oh, I know this one. Uh-huh. Oh, I should have said Rena. Rena, yes, <laughs> correct. Rena, what's You can answer? tell I'm working entertainment. Where's my actual buzzer? Um, so this is Greg James. Yes. Uh, so he's the saviour of Radio 1 at the minute, <laughs> the isn't moment, he? Yep. Um, and his breakfast show is being extended over the summer till 11am. Mm. Um, which, again... I'm behind. <laughs> I'm totally... You get brunch. Why not have brunch radio? It shouldn't just be breakfast and lunch. Well, especially if you're a younger audience over the summer. Yeah, they have lions. My niece doesn't get up until 10. There you go. So breakfast for her is 11. Um, so, yeah. And do you know what? He's very good. He's very funny. The other DJs at the minute, they're having a bit of a reshuffle. Mm. And they're finding their voice still. So I think a lot lies on Greg. Yes. Um, I was listening to him the other day in the gym and he did they did the neanderthal remix of sia's chandelier <laughs> and i out loud for about four minutes just really laughed as i was doing chest presses <laughs> and people were like really looking at me but i, was, I just thought i like you greg that's good. good no he does a good job uh, three and a half hours uh, a day it's quite a lot for a bbc show uh, i don't know what that makes ricky melvin and charlie down to probably like an hour and a half i think they, they've got the they've got a great deal uh, out of this um do you think it it's right to, to switch things up for the summer? Yeah, I think so. Like if you have got, particularly if you're looking for all important younger audience, if, you know, you are talking kind of people who might be on school holidays, that sort of thing, or off university and are, are you know, sleeping in, then <laughs> yes. Also, I think it's just a nice alignment between like the BBC and a McDonald's breakfast. That, <laughs> That's that good. Makes sense. That's a good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, right, so question number two. Uh, who has said this week that PR emails are driving him nuts? Rebecca. Not me. I have not said that. Uh, I have some sympathy with this, though. So it's Joe Rayner mm. was asked uh, basically to speak at a conference. I think it was about um, sort of PRs and, and the do's and don'ts and kind of wrote back what I think was a really politely scathing email. Uh, just being like, actually, PRs are sending round absolute nonsense. My inbox is full of absolute crap. Um, you know, I, I don't need this. And, and I think he's, he's got a point that there is a little bit of a spray and pray attitude among PRs. I yeah. certainly get a lot of stuff. And I will say, like I think, and he does at the end, like, you know, there are brilliant PRs in the world. And I think being a PR is one of those jobs that's actually, there are a lot of people who don't do it well. It's actually very hard to do well, but there are people who do it brilliantly. He you know, was annoyed though, wasn't he? That yeah, he, he received like non- five. Oh yeah, yes, it's five, five people follow ups. Up. And and this this is what my inbox. Is. People will send you stuff. I also don't get as many as Jay Rayner, but like people will send you completely like inappropriate, nothing to do with my beats. Um, I was looking through my inbox today. Mm. Actually, I had like uh, Scandi underwear being, and I was scrolling through this and it was kind of quite up on the big screen. And I was like, this is just some, something. It's, it's, I, it, this is for work, guys, honestly, <laughs> but it's not my, my work. Uh, I've had one so about- So you reply to them, right? Yes, yeah, obviously, obviously. <laughs> for example, some, some uh, yeah, examples, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've had ones about ball bearings. Um, I had There's one about, there. is, yeah, uh, d- uh, ball bearings is in like the- No, I didn't. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, the next, one, the next one was about, uh, is things surprising things that could be be ruining your sex life like living with your parents and all that. so that's surprising <laughs> well, again enough. nothing to do with with what i report and do they come back and to they you? follow up and go any interest in this and you're sort of like no obviously not um and i think a lot of it's automated mm. actually i think they are just putting you in a well, database so so he was talking about synapse and the mm. synapse is one of the tools journalists and prs can use to kind of communicate with each other and there's a the story was was picked up by press gazette and in that Mark Bukowski, who's a non-exec at Synapse, sort of agreed with him. And I, I was reading it, and I was like, he's sort of proving the point of the platform, this sort of, mm. the connection. So I registered for Synapse <laughs> uh, this week uh, and logged on. Uh, and I logged on as a PR, and some of the things we do, we do some PR things. Um, and who was the first name that came up as an option? Jay Rayner. <laughs> so, <laughs> Please tell me you emailed him. Well, so either... <laughs> he's just like number one on the list or is it a cunning way to publicize synapse is it is it all very yeah 
in Or is it, if things. you didn't like what Jay Rayner had to say, why don't you send him an email? They've yeah. just set up vengeance on the platform. Yes. I don't know. Um, Can I just say, Jay's, whoever's uh, sending Jay invitations to restaurants that he doesn't want, <laughs> I'll, I'll have them, please. Yeah, he was complaining that he's very specific about, he books under a pseudonym, he doesn't take freebies, he doesn't tell people he's coming, and it says all that on his bio, on his Twitter, and people are still going, would you like to come tomorrow for free? And he's like, that's not the point. <laughs> so he won't, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, get in touch. Uh, details in the show notes. All uh, right, question number three. Uh, which unlikely guest has signed up for Channel 4's election night coverage? Rebecca. Rebecca. This is Nadine Dorries. Yes. So, this is my colleague David that broke the story. And um, it's just, I just think it's hilarious. So yeah, Nadine Dorries, the person who was culture secretary, attempted to privatise Channel 4 when they didn't want it. <laughs> They've kind of played a blinder. And I think there must be a memo or Horse Free Road somewhere that just says, lol, can you imagine how many memes there are going to be with the C4 logo on on July 5th? Like, I just, that's the only reason they've done it is because... It's a good way yeah. of actually getting people to watch their coverage, I think. But it, I mean, this I think, woman I think lobbied. She's, I think she's a good booking. <sighs> no? I, uh, but, uh, from a I telly said, perspective. Uh, from, from a, a telly perspective... perspective yeah. Yeah, it kills me. But yes, okay, because she is unfiltered. Yeah. And she yeah. does say things and then changes her mind. So you do have something to go against. So, you know, but it feels like, uh, you know, TV's kind of trying to make characters of politicians. Mm. So here's Boris Johnson, a lovable fool, and now he's... You know, he was prime minister. Here's Nigel Farage. Let's stick him in the jungle. And now you've got... Because yeah. I know when I was doing Channel 4 shows and Nadine was absolutely inappropriate to be a guest on on the shows, the bosses were trying to get mm. us to get her. Oh, I, wow. I, I hit back a few times and I was like, no, 100% no. Was this during the privatisation debate? This or? was a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. No, there was a. Oh. Then there was a, a real like she was on a list and she was red. <laughs> it was a flat Don't let nose. her in the building. It was a flat nose. She won't leave. She'll sell the so furniture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I wonder whether all those people that said no originally now have been made redundant and uh, now <laughs> she's <laughs> on. Could be. Uh, congratulations, Rebecca. Uh, your job and your prize is to try and book Nadine Dorries for the media podcast next week. Okay. Uh, you can go off and do that. Um, uh, my thanks to Rebecca and Rena. Uh, Rebecca, where can people keep up with your work? Uh, so you can find me on broadcastnow.co.uk and I'm on X Twitter as at Rebecca K. Cooney and threads as at any name but Becky. Very good. And Rena, how can people keep up with what you're doing? Um... Gosh, well, the stalking you, in the street. Yeah. I mean, there's my Instagram. It's not very interesting. Um, no, I will be uh, exec producing a first series with Alison Hammond on BBC One, which we will be starting uh, in July. Oh, that's exciting! Yeah, which should be an actual commission, Yay! <laughs> uh, which will be on next year. So, uh, and what's the format? Um, it's Alison Hammond's big weekend. Um, so the format is that she. Um, will go and hang around uh, for a day or two with a celeb okay. and just like get in their bed and get in the bath and like <laughs> just it's a it's a really unfiltered celeb interview is Nadine Dorries on your list she is now <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you both thank you thank you Thank you all. And that's it for today. Remember, there's 25% off your first booking at the London Podcast Studios, where we record our show every week. Uh, just use the code MEDIAPOD. Uh, so head to thelondonpodcaststudios.com for 25% off with the code MEDIAPOD. And if you're new to the show, why not hit follow on your podcast app of choice? And hey, whilst you're there, why not leave us a review? Uh, my name is Matt Deegan. The producer was Matt Hill. It was a Rethink Audio production. I'll see you next week. 